Lesson four. Here we're gonna look at the curveball scenarios that you may encounter during your multiple mini interviews. Please speak to the examiner about how you go about treating a patient with HIV. What precautions would you take? Is it possible to reject the patient because of their HIV status? Uh, why is it important to be aware of the patient's HIV status when treating them? Think about this scenario. Feel free to take more than a minute reading time on this occasion to really consider and plan what it is you'd like to say. Good dental health is an important part of good overall health for everybody, particularly people with HIV and others that are immunocompromised. Under the Equality Act of 2010, it's illegal for a dentist to refuse to treat you because you have HIV. And this applies to both NHS and private. The logic for this is that the same procedures should be used for all patients regardless of their blood, of blood-borne diseases. You should always be wearing a mask, you should always have gloves on, you should always have some sort of eye protection or visor for every patient you see and treat. This is as well as having good practice in terms of avoiding sharps injuries. All the needles that I've used throughout my training and work in life have had a sheath on them. So it's just ludicrous to think that you wouldn't use that safety feature to protect yourself, your, your, the dental nurse and all your patients. It's so unethical as well as unlawful to refuse dental care to people with HIV, especially considering now the, the huge leaps and advancements in treating of HIV. There's the new tricyclic drugs where it stops a lot of the, it stops it even being transferable from person to person. So it's also a bit illogical. Lots of people have HIV without knowing it. So dentists treat people all the time with HIV and neither party even knows it. So there's already that need to take the right precautions on everybody. There are also people who do know and decline to declare their HIV status as they don't see the relevance or that they're worried it's going to impact on how they get treated. And you know what, they, they might, it might have an impact on their care even though it shouldn't. What precautions would you take when treating a patient with HIV? People often think they have to take extra care when treating patients with HIV. They may be more careful when they're cleaning or sterilizing equipment, wanting to prevent the spread. But as I've said before, standard infection control procedures are designed to prevent transmission of HIV and other infectious diseases. So really there are no extra steps are required if you're already following the procedure properly. You should emphasize on this station, you know, standard infection control procedures already take care of a blood-borne diseases issue. Dentists used to say or make that patients with HIV take the last appointment of the day to allow for extra sterilization, but research shows that this isn't necessary and has little to no advantage. So far, nobody's taken a dentist to court for this, but this is most likely illegal under the Equality Act of 2010, which covers even indirect discrimination as well. Next station. Treating patients who can't speak English. This always tends to be tricky as you have to converse through a translator and trust that the translator is saying what you want them to say and how you want them to say it. You're somewhat at their mercy, really. Here it goes. Imagine you're in a clinic and the patient comes in and can't speak any English. So number one, speak to the interviewer about the important ethical dilemmas involved in this situation. How would you go about approaching this situation? Some of the ethical dilemmas around achieving informed consent encountered with this station. Like all other patients, this patient must know the benefits and risks of their treatment and be given a full discretion about it to achieve valid consent. They need to know if there are any other suitable alternatives just like other patients would and any implications for not carrying out the treatment. Again, this is for valid consent. Just because you don't offer a certain type of treatment in your practice or area, and now this applies to everyone by the way, doesn't mean you don't make the patient aware of its existence. You can't just assume that they can't afford an implant or alternative private option, or that they're not willing to commute to here or there for a certain type of treatment. So you have to put, lay everything out on the table so the patient knows their options. Information must, must not be withheld by healthcare professionals solely if you think it's gonna cause the patient a bit of distress. But obviously you've got to, you can just have a bit of tact about how you do things. The patient must have capacity. The patient must be able to understand, weigh up, retain, uh, and communicate their decision. If they do not fit any of these four aspects or for any particular decision, it is thought that they lack capacity, so they cannot give uh, consent to the procedure. This is why you need a translator, and it should be a professional translator as opposed to a family member or a friend. I actually had a person in today translating for the friend. Every time I spoke to the, spoke, um, to the patient, 
waiting for their friend to translate. Their, tra their friend just spoke back in English without translating anything for me. So basically I just had to delay the treatment until we could get a professional translator in. Otherwise I couldn't have done valid consent, achieved valid consent. When making a decision to carry out treatment, this can't be done through coercion. It must be done willingly without pr pressure from friends, family, or medical staff. Again, this is why we like to have neutral professional medical translators pr uh, present. With a language barrier, it would be difficult for patients to fully understand the treatment options. They could end up having a treatment they're not fully aware of. This would mean that consent was not valid and it's a medical legal nightmare for you and it's no good for the patient either. So the obvious approach to this situation we have been discussing all along, hire a translator from a reputable company who understands and can translate into the medical lingual, lingo. I personally will not carry out any treatment on non-speaking, non-English speaking patients unless there's a translator present. And I'll repeat it, this is because how can I achieve valid consent if a patient doesn't understand what I've said? The translator should be a formal one. For any invasive treatments or irreversible treatments, I don't allow patients, family or friends to act as translator. I don't know if they're translating what I'm saying or if they're even letting the patient make the decision about their own treatment at all. It also alleviates the pressure from friends and family, I think, as well. I mean, would you want to be responsible for, say, the correct tooth being extracted from a family member? Even when using a translator, you should be watching the body language of the patient and the translator. You can use non-verbal cues to communicate. Even if you don't speak a word of the language, you'll have an idea or a feel for what the patient is feeling through their body language. When speaking through a translator, you should speak slow and direct and uh, voice your conversation to the patient. So the translator's there, patient's here. The whole time you should be speaking and looking and communicating with the patient. You're only using the translator as a medium to be understood by the patient. Origami station. Back when I was applying, I remember doing stations similar to this. I can't be sure, but I think for mine, the instructions maybe weren't exactly correct. Now, maybe I could have got it wrong, but I think they might have added a degree of extra pro of problem solving or left out a bit of instruction to add pressure. But either way, um, take your time, keep your cool. What they're really looking at here is your ability to perform and follow instructions under pressure. Ultimately, no one cares if you can design an origami dog. A good candidate will follow the instructions, but don't rush the early stages or towards the end, you'll start to encounter problems when things don't quite fold the way you want them to. It's a bit like your driving test. Talk through the examiner what you're planning on doing stage by stage. Shows that you've got a logic and a system in place. So, oh, one fold ear here, mouth here, you know, whatever it is. This is a good opportunity to display manual dexterity, but ultimately I believe that this station, like a lot of the MMIs, is about keeping your cool and watching how you react under pressure. Do you maintain professional or do you get flustered and let it, let it get the better of you? Panicking helps no one here. Even if you've made a complete mess out of it, you can take a deep breath, cut your losses and you know there could be a bit of time to start again. It just sort of shows that you're, you're not going to be defeated by a bit of paper folding. And then the second time around, you can make sure you don't make the same mistakes twice. Try and maintain some level of communication with the examiner. It shows you get multitask and I think it shows an element of confidence as well. Lesson four, completed. Do you have an interview for medicine, dentistry or veterinary school? The interview is the final hurdle of your application, but also the most competitive. Are you nervous about your interview or unsure where to start preparation? Here's where we can help. With a few clicks, you'll get access to 100 Medic Mind video tutorials covering 10 hours of theory, 150 MMI stations, live weekly webinars and more. You'll get a breakdown of all the topics interviews typically cover and real life MMI stations. Our award-winning interview course is trusted by over 12,000 students in over 37 countries and has been written by official medical school examiners. So, what are you waiting for? Get started on our course today.